Hi, my name is John Leonardelli, VE3 IPS. Thank you for having me at the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. My talk is going to be on parks on the air. Three practical methods for successful activations. I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've been doing in activating the different parks using different methods. I hope you enjoy it. There's also an opportunity to ask questions at the end. I'm going to cover mobile operations, picnic table operations, and travel activations. I'm taking a crawl, walk, run approach where we start off with simple things and we add complexity to it as we gain experience. So what is Parks on the Air? Parks on the Air, or POTA, is the International Portable Amateur Radio Operations that promotes emergency awareness and communications from national, federal, and state and provincial level parks. You can look them up at www.parksontheair.com. The benefits of this is getting outdoors and breathing some fresh air. Enjoy your state and national parks. There's a lot of beauty out there. Be the station everyone wants to work and create pileups. Hunters and chasers want you. You also have the ability to practice emergency communications abilities because you're operating on battery power in many cases. And you're also having fun with like-minded operators. It's not uncommon for several hams to get together on a Saturday morning to go activate a park, share information, share techniques, and have fun. Activators are those people operating from the parks. We need lots of activators because hunters and chasers are those people that are going to be contacting you. Here's a tip. Remember, you must register to participate and do not forget to upload your logs when you're doing park activations. The Parks on the Air website has two areas that would be of extreme interest. One is the scheduled activations. There's also one for spots where you would spot yourself. So you have an ability to know who's on, where they are, and what frequency and mode they're operating in. As well as you have a map capability that allows you to search for local parks in your neighborhood that you can activate. When you click on those yellow dots, it'll give you information of the park ID and allows you to drill down to see who has activated the parks. You would be surprised. There are various parks that have not been activated. These are the parks you may want to go to because hunters or chasers are looking for those to add those to those list of parks that they worked. Here's a tip. Use the website or the smartphone app to spot yourself. This allows the hunters and chasers to know where you are, what frequency you're on, and the time that you're on so they can try to operate you. The first one is mobile operations. Any mobile FM radio that's in your car can be used on simplex channels from high spots. There's a couple of parks in my neighborhood that are quite high above sea level and have excellent simplex coverage. I've activated some parks just using two meter FM. You could try other modes on VHF, UHF like SSB or CW, even FT8. So there will be people that are operating FT8 from the parks. If you're gonna operate HF, there are various popular HF mobiles. The ICOM has various ones, probably the most popular recent one that I've seen is the ICOM 7100 and the 7,000. For Yesu, you'll see a lot of 857s. 891 has become extremely popular as the POTA radio of choice. Kenwood has some options as well too. The 480 is the antenna tuner version. There's also a 200 watt version. I know a bunch of guys that are using that as a mobile. Remember, you can use any radio for park activation, even a handheld. There's nothing you need to go out and buy. You can see here's a couple of pictures of some activations that I did using the FT-891. Mobile operations power. Obviously in the car, you're gonna use your existing automobile battery. You can also use an additional auxiliary battery that would have an isolator as can be seen in this diagram in the top right-hand corner. You'll also find voltage boosters will allow the 13.8 volts be used for best performance. 
This is because the car battery in a standard format when the alternator is not running is just over 12 volts. Some of the radios may not like that voltage and may shut off doing a lower voltage. So the voltage boosters may be useful to help you with that, to increase the voltage. MFJ makes a couple. Uh, West Mountain Radio makes, uh, makes one as well too. The one that I use is actually an early version of the N8 XJK Super Booster that was then licensed to West Mountain Radio. I typically will use that in the car when running higher power. The other thing that's useful is battery analyzers. Buddy Pull makes a couple. PowerWorks makes one. Uh, even a pocket DVM could be used. This is just to monitor your voltages. Obviously, a battery analyzer that shows the input coming in, the wattage going out, might be a little bit more useful to let you do some power management. You know, here's a tip. Auto batteries are typically 12 volts. Radios need 13.8 volts. Most radios will shut off at 11 volts. I know the ICOM 706 that my friend has is very common with that. Also, you're going to lose voltage in the resistance of long wire lengths. So use a number 10 or smaller gauge wire. For my auxiliary battery, I have a jumper cable that I bought that uses a number one gauge wire that is about 16 feet long. And it actually has no very low, low resistance. And it does not drop the voltage that much. So that might be something you may want to look at. What about antennas for mobile operations? Well, you can use any mobile VHF, UHF antenna you already have in place, right? We're working on something on two meter FM or 446 simplex, maybe even six meters. However, those that are operating HF mobile typically will use antennas like the Diamond antenna, the Hustler using the MO4 that's been around for years. Hamsticks is another popular one. Scorpion and Tar Heel screwdrivers are very uh, useful as well too. The Yesu ATAS antenna is very popular with hams running Yesu radios. Uh, you can also use a trailer hitch mount to put an antenna on it or even a hybrid. In this case here, you're operating from your car, but you're using an external antenna. Remember to pay attention to antenna grounding and panel bonding when you're operating HF mobile, as that will make a difference in the signal that's being put out. Mobile operations after action report. Okay, obviously in the top left-hand corner, uh, KB9 EVB has quite the porcupine of antennas on his car. So he probably doesn't have to worry about bringing any antennas out to the park to operate from. Other examples here in the bottom left-hand corner, I have an FT817 with a tuner with an NFED Pac-10 antenna that was operating in a Parks on the Air um, event. In the middle here, I've got my ICOM 705. I'm actually running this with a 1296 transverter. Uh, we attempted to activate a park on 1.2 gigahertz. I did not have enough to get the 10 activations required to activate the park, but we had a lot of fun trying. The right side shows a picture of my typical setup here. I have a trunk hitch mount with a mast on it. On top of that, I've got a six meter narrow vertical antenna. And at the bottom, I've got a 1296 antenna. And if you look carefully, I also have a 40 and 20 meter link dipole hanging off that as well. So I have the ability of operating four bands. Again, use what you have. You don't really have to go out and invest in too much in order to be active or activate some parks from your car or truck. What about picnic table operations? Okay, so now you're gonna to drive to that park or hike up to that park and you're really gonna operate from a picnic table, which is very typical of parks. There are those that are doing lunch and pot activations. So during their lunch break, they'll sneak off to a park, drive up, do some operations, get their contacts in, get back to the office. If there's no picnic tables at your park, bring your own table and chair. In that case, you might find a cart or a wagon useful to transport gear from your car to the operating site. One tip is to understand local laws regarding wires and trees. I know when I was at a U.S. state park, 
I was chastised for throwing a wire in a tree. Apparently the wire could damage the tree and I was told to cease and desist my operation. So please pay attention to what local requirements are regarding the putting up of antennas. If not, you'll have to figure out a way to get that wire up without a tree, which is pretty easy by the way. Here's a couple of pictures here. On the left side was my first version of a go box. That thing weighed about 80 pounds. It was extremely heavy. And of course I bought more radios than was required uh, to operate from. But anyways, we were testing out some uh, abilities and that's also my MCOM go box that I would be using. On the right hand side, here's a picture of another go box. And in this case here, it just shows the various bits and pieces of equipment that's in, um, in the box that's required. We have the radio, we have a battery, we have various antennas and we have a laptop and coax and analyzers and a logbook and pens and pencils and coax. Most people have this stuff already, so you may not have to go out and get anything. Now, what kind of radios are people using at picnic tables? Well, popular HF radios typically include QRP radios. So again, the usual ICOM uh, HF mobile radios are there. I know a couple of hams are bringing their 7300 out. I have an ICOM 705, an ICOM 703, and a 7300. I brought those out as well, too. Again, depends where I'm going, what I'm doing, and what I want to want to pack. With Yesu, I'm using an ADA FT818, the 891, and I've brought my 991 out at times because of the multi-mode capability on it. But most of my activity lately has been uh, on HF. And obviously we have the Kenwood radios as well. Other radios that are perfect for picnic table operation are the KX1, K2, KX3, and KX2 series, very popular radio. And there's also the Tentex as well too. One tip you may wanna consider greatly is operating at 20 watts or 50 watts. This saves on your battery and it's just as effective as a 100 watt radio. A 100 watt radio could be drawing 20 to 25 amps of current, but if you're running half the power, typically you run half the current so you can use a, a lower wattage battery. If you're running at 20 watts, you'll have more runtime. So you may be able to stretch your battery out a lot longer. Now, if you we use the mathematics, 20 watts to 40 watts is 3 dB, doubling the power. 40 watts to 80 watts is 3 dB. So that's gonna be one or two S units difference. Some of the newer radios have 3 dB per S meter and others have six. But anyways, regardless, you will find that if you're running at 20 watts or 50 watts or even in between, you'll find your signal will be just as strong as a 100 watt radio. The importance of that is saving your battery. Here's a picture of an ICOM 7200. Actually, I should have included that in a popular HF radio. I have one of those. I bring that out uh, because it's rugged. And I don't have to worry about my 7300 display getting damaged or even on the 705. Uh, this is a display on the 7200 is a lot different. What about power? Well, for a picnic table, our power requirements are a lot different because we're traveling there with a vehicle. Typically, a lot of people use sealed lead acid batteries. They're cheap. Typically, they're good for QRP. They are heavy though. However, they do not like to be run down to 11 volts. So that is pretty critical. So you have to keep an eye on that. So that's where you're gonna use your battery management and your analyzer are gonna be useful. You probably may even need a rig runner to operate multiple devices from that battery. Lately, there's been a lot of technology in lithium iron phosphate batteries, Life PO4. These are lightweight, they provide high capacity, they're great for QRO. They're, they're, they're extremely safe if well used. They are more expensive, but right out of the box, they offer 13.4 or 13.2 volts, which is close enough to the battery, to the radio requirement of 13.8. In many cases, you'll probably have a lot of fun with a 10 amp hour battery, which if you're running 20, 30, 40 watts, uh, will allow you to operate for a couple hours on sideband. If you're gonna operate on CW, then the, um, the requirements is gonna be a lot more higher. So you'll probably run probably more at the 20 watt level. Buddy Pole A123 and Bieno are typical batteries. I know with both of them, they offer an excellent warranty. I've had a Bieno battery that was seven years old. They have a 10 year warranty. 
and then replace the battery. Actually, I got the battery uh, came in the mail today. If you go on Amazon, Renogy and Echoworthy are other brands. I have several Echoworthy batteries. I have a 30 amp hour battery that uh, is cost effective and two 100 amp hour batteries that are cost effective. So I'm thinking I can run a couple of hundred watts on two meter FM uh, sideband or simplex uh, from the parks and use that with a Yagi. And at Dayton Hamvention, I saw the Gigaparts private label that they saw. They were sold out. It is a life PO4 battery, but they included a voltage meter in the battery with a switch. So right in the case, you can check the battery uh, while operating. And the price is very cost effective as well, too. And as you cobble these things up to as yourself, you'll see you can get a PowerWorks box to put everything in there, keep everything nice and neat. These batteries are also useful for emergency communications or backup power in your home as well. Here's a tip. Auto boosters are not recommended as they are 12 volts. A lot of these are SLA batteries. And if also, if you're going to run extended operations, you do need a solar panel. So that might be something you'll find in your battery charger, especially the, the one by BuddyPole. That battery uh, management system it does include an input for solar power. So you can use that to solar power your battery if you're going to be operating all day or maybe on a weekend if you're camping. What about antennas? Well, these are the popular antennas that I use. Buddy pole, which is the dipole, buddy stick, which is the vertical, and recently I acquired the buddy hex two element beam. My most popular antenna I use is the Pac-10 link dipole. I have that set up for 20 meters and 40 meters, and I also have their NFED half wave antenna as well too. The super antenna MP1 with the bracket allows picnic table operation very easily. The Chameleon M-Pass is another one that I've been using and the Tactical Dipole. These ones do require tuners, uh, but they work very well and they're fast to get up and deploy. Also Homebrew, uh, there's a lot of opportunity here to make your own antennas. And I would recommend maybe using LDG Balance as I have been using, they seem to work very well and support the ability to use uh, different nine to one, four to one, 49 to one, different balance types for different types of antennas. One tip I would recommend is telescopic masts, the fiberglass ones, and even painter poles that you can get a big box hardware store are also useful to get antennas up in the air, especially if you can't throw a wire up in a tree. So if we take a look at the bottom left-hand corner, you can see in this deployment here a couple of weeks ago, I'm actually running an 18-foot buddy pole mast on a tripod assembly. And I have the 40 meter, 20 meter antenna connected to that. I was hoping for a six meter opening. I brought my six meter vertical out. We have other parks nearby and a lot of us do six meter park to park activity. And then on the right side of that picture, I've got a, another uh, dipole antenna set up, a military antenna. In the middle here, you can see I've got my buddy stick antenna set up on a tripod and the SWR here on 14.2 is 1.0. So I was able to get the SWR down. And here's a picture of the buddy hex deployed out at Mary Lake Park. That antenna, I was working into 20 meters, Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, Kentucky, Alabama, the Southern states. I had a Station CU3 from the Zors gave me a call and I rotated the antenna around, picked them up by three stronger S units, and we had a great 20 minute chat. Now, the chasers and hunters were waiting for our conversation to end so they can get the contacts into the log. But, anyways, uh, some of these uh, beam antennas could be useful out in the field. Okay, after action report. So Picture here on the left-hand side, here's a deployment. I'm using um, a 40 meter uh, antenna set up on a, a mast. This was actually set up for Envis. Uh, so we were able to do some regional communications in the activation of this park. Um, and I brought out a couple other radios. So in this case here, I've got the KS3 that I'm using. Able to make contacts at 10 watts, no problem on sideband and CW. In the middle here is the FT817, obviously sitting on top of a picnic table. So you will have some success with some QRP radios when the band conditions are good. 
In this case here, I've got a small MFJ antenna that I'm using uh, in order to make some contacts, which was not bad. This one, I had to hike up to it. And sure enough, when I got to the summit, there was a couple of picnic tables there. So I was a little bit surprised to have that. But anyways, it worked out perfect. In the top right-hand corner, uh, here's an operation from a park in Maine. And I'm using the G90 radio with the M-Pass antenna using the vertical. Yeah, uh, that was something uh, that I actually uh, would also reside in a travel operation because I flew down to uh, to Maine and then drove up, flew down to Boston, then drove up to Maine uh, as part of my business trip and stopped to make that activation. In the bottom corner here, we got some park operation for uh, Joda, um, which is uh, for scouts. And we were operating uh, there from the park and we're successful in making some great contacts. Okay, so now this is where we get to the run approach. Uh, you've got experience working from the parks. Um, you've got your loadout kits laid out, you know exactly what to do. You just got to find places to go and operate from. So this is why I say it's really more for serious operators in POTA. Because there's a fair amount of work involved, right? Proper planning is required in advance for parks and gear. Here you can use your mobile radio, depending on how you're transport, uh, how you're uh, transporting yourself to these different travel spots, and use that with a mobile antenna, or you can use portable or QRP radios. Basically, it's look on the map, find a park, drive up, hike up, and operate. It can also be used for fast activations on highway rest stops. May not be totally parks on the air, but there are some locations, depending on where you're traveling, that would allow you to have a park that you can pull into, activate the park, and you can treat that as a highway rest stop. Any mode can be used. Pick a mode, go ahead and activate. Now, the tip here that I offer is your loadout depends on your transportation method. If you're going to be flying to Florida, for example, you may have a different arrangement in how you want to set up your equipment. If you're going to be driving to Florida, obviously that'll be different as well. So you have to keep track of weight and the equipment that you're going to bring. But it's all doable because I have done it. Okay, what kind of radios? Well, we're traveling, right? So most of these radios, you know, the big tip is these are TSA-friendly radios. I've never had any issues bringing different radios, sometimes four radios at once. Always carry on. You always bring your radios in carry-on, either in your carry-on suitcase or in your backpack. Typically, these are going to be small format radios if you're flying. If you're gonna be traveling by car, then you can bring whatever it is that you want because you'll have lots of trunk space in order to bring it. Popular radios here are typically, um, normally what I bring out is my 705 or the 703. 703 has a built-in antenna tuner, 705 does not, but the 705 offers VHF and UHF capability, which is useful. I brought my FT817 and newer 818 many times out to the parks and as well as my 891. They're pretty small. They, uh, the form factor is a lot easier for the ASU radios to fit into, uh, into a backpack or into a carry-on bag. One radio that's created a lot of interest is the Lab 5599 Discovery. Uh, that's in the bottom right-hand corner. It's a pretty small, flat radio. Look up the measurements on it. Uses a speaker mic. There's no built-in speaker. There's no built-in tuner, but it's very small, lightweight. Puts out 10 watts. It's an SDR radio. The one on the, the left is uh, uh, the KX3. So again, the Elecraft KX series. Uh, Wayne at Elecraft actually designed these radios really for portable operations with POTA in mind as well and SOTA, which is summits on the air. And again, we got some of the 10 tech radios that could be popular as well too. Top right-hand corner is the loadout I brought for my trip to Halifax. This is fits into a low pro uh, camera case uh, that is sort of like a briefcase style. So I was able to get the radio in there. My battery, you can see that in the left side with the yellow label, that's in a fireproof protection. Various batteries for uh, the radio and then some camera equipment as well too. You could also spot an Elecraft T1 tuner in there. I didn't end up using that tuner at all. So if I was to travel again, depending on what I would do, I would probably leave some stuff behind that I tend to overpack anyways. 
Okay, what are we going to do for power? Well, again, you know, we're thinking light and powerful. So again, the Buddy Pole A123 battery, the BioNO, there's some smaller versions of the Echo Worthy, Renault G, Gigaparts, private label. The other one is RC car batteries. This works great with the ICOM 703 and the Yaesu 817, 818. They'll allow the radio to operate as low as, I think, 9.6 volts just in the design of the radio so i can get away with a, a $25 rc car battery that is five amps here i have a, a power analyzer connected to that as well too so i can see the voltage that voltage is at 11.17 uh, volts which is fine so the radio will work no problem on for that one thing you do want to do is really check your air carrier rules if you're flying um, maximum 144 watt hours is okay in a carry-on and I would probably add a fireproof bag for it just in case. Also check your radio voltage requirements. Most radios require 13.8 volts plus or minus 15 percent. So obviously if your battery is 13.2 or 13.4 volts you're pretty close to that 13.8. It's when we now start operating a SLA battery. Those are very heavy. I kind of don't recommend those for air travel. If you're bringing it in the car it probably works but when you start um, pulling current from those batteries the voltage starts to drop and uh, the radio is susceptible to shut off as the battery is too low. One tip is the lithium, ba lithium battery needs a special charger. You must order that when you buy the battery. Some batteries I've seen have um, a voltage, voltage charger built into the battery, so you could just plug it into a 12-volt source. You may want to take a look at that uh, just to make sure in case you need to buy an extra charger. I, I've been using a NOCO charger. Uh, it's um, I got it at the Canadian Tire store. Uh, you can find it at the big box hardware stores as well, too. And this supports very various battery types. It actually does uh, car batteries. It also does SLA and also does the lithium battery as well, too. And then there's some intelligence there to auto shut off when the battery is charged. Travel antennas. Well, I'm 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 into antennas, so um, I've used the Buddy Pool and Buddy Stick with great success. The Super Antenna MP1 works great. The Pac-10, I've talked about that as uh, as the dipole. There's the Chameleon antennas. The Mpass one is the one that's uh, become very popular lately. The Tactical Delta or Tactical Dipole antenna as well too is kind of useful. Wolf River Coil. Um, I'm seeing people use that. Uh, I have a Wolf River coil. Soda beams make some wire antennas that are useful for uh, POTA, even though it might be more for summits on the air in, in Europe. Um, people do summits. They don't do as many parks. We have parks. We don't have as many summits. Dipoles are great antennas. The Pac-12 antenna. Uh, I made a quarter inch uh, rod version to lighten it up. The MFJ 1620T whip, this is a little four foot base loaded whip, works great. I actually used that when I was in California on a summits on the air activity and worked a station in uh, Russia, uh, running three watts on the FT817. NorCal doublet's another one, you're gonna need a tuner for that. That's a pretty simple antenna you can make. You actually make it with speaker wire. You can find some, some information on that uh, just by Googling. And the Comet HF 350M, this is an antenna that came out recently to support the ICOM 705. The biggest tip I'll give you on that antenna is you need definitely need to read the instructions. Uh, there is a trick to the measurement of the telescopic element and you definitely do need a radial for it. I know some people that um, open the antenna, throw everything in the garbage and then they, they're, they're scratching their heads why they can't seem to be making some proper contacts or the why the SWR is too high. So this one here is the one that's in the middle in the green case, uh, affectionately known in Japan as the toy box, uh, also known as the full stomach, which means it includes a 160 meter coil. Um, 160 meters isn't really <laughs> the greatest band I think you want to use for POTA, but uh, if the band conditions are good, why not? The one here with the mount top, here's your buddy stick antenna. This is actually using the short coil uh, with a telescopic whip. This works very, very well. It's one of my go-to antennas that I typically go and grab. Top right-hand corner, uh, this is uh, the uh, hybrid micro ballon, 
with the jaws clamp and a 60 foot wire um, that is used by chameleon antennas. This kind of is one of the elements that's in the MPAS kit now that offers uh, a lot more flexibility and options. However, you can buy this uh, on its own and it works very well. I've been using that for quite some time. In the bottom left-hand corner, this is my little case where uh, you can see the buddy stick coil in there, different wires and radials and coax and stuff like that. That was actually in my carry-on bag um, when I went to Halifax by plane. The other two antennas here, these are light versions using thin Teflon wire of a, a, a Pactena a link dipole. And then there's another dipole I made here with some 3D printed parts, again, using um, thin Teflon. I think this wire was 24 gauge, so pretty lightweight. I've got a little ballon in a little box there, so it just simplifies things. You could almost put this in a, in a, in a jacket pocket. One tip though, when it comes to antennas, is think about home brewing lightweight antennas. All these antennas that are commercial, they're just coils and, 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 and tubing. You can replicate these with PVC tubing and uh, some wire or some speaker wire. You can make your own antennas and it might be preferable to do that in order to keep your weight down depending on how you're traveling. So travel action after action report. So in this case here, you can see in the top left-hand corner, this was a recent trip that I made to Halifax. I activated uh, three parks that were never activated before. The beauty of them, they were all on the beach. So I had a great opportunity to enjoy the, uh, the rolling waves and be able to make contacts. Um, I had a great thrill when I had a station from Spain call me when I was doing my activation. And this is using the buddy stick antenna. I've got um, a Delkin carbon fiber camera tripod that I'm using here that kind of snaps together. I don't think they make it anymore. You may want to Google around for it. Uh, but I found it to be very, very useful because it was lightweight. In the bottom corner, we have here a little bag where I have the carbon fiber uh, mast assembly in there. I have a ground rod and I have the buddy stick uh, tubing elements in there too. All fits in the small thin carry case. Keep everything nice and neat. Um, you'll find when you go to these parks on the air activity, um, you're either losing stuff or forgetting stuff behind. So here's an opportunity to keep everything nice and neat. This one in the middle here is I brought the G90 radio out um, to do some operation when I was in Maine with the uh, Chameleon Empass antenna. You can see here, great, great spot. And then in this one here, um, I didn't get enough activations for it. This was really um, in uh, Italy at Cron Crosen Plants up in the Alps. Uh, so great location to operate from, but I bad conditions were not that great that day. So I was not able to get the activation in. And it was really more of a summits on the air, but it was just to show you, hey, there's a, a picnic table or a bench. You can operate from some high spots and be able to go and get your contacts in. And here you can see this one is actually my FT817, little bio NO batteries, only a little three amp hour battery. And again, I'm using the MFJ antenna. There were no trees at that location. So basically your antennas had to be self-supporting. So again, proper planning and understanding of where you're going to is gonna allow you to figure out the type of equipment that you're gonna bring out. If you wanna know more about that um, after action report, uh, you can go to my, my blog as listed below. You could also look at uh, qrpeer.com. I have a published article in there as well. Okay, so to finalize my presentation here, let's not forget, how do I charge my batteries? You may want to consider that when you're traveling. You may require to get uh, voltage adapters or transformers, depending on where you're going and what it is that you're doing. So keep that in mind. Uh, are you bringing the laptop and the charger, right? Or it's power supply. Um, I use a Microsoft Surface Go. Seems to work very well for me for logging and general uh, activity. Power stations with a pure sine wave inverter. You've seen them. RAV Power is one, Jackery, Goal Zero. But they're all 12-volt output. So these go back to being an SLA-type battery. I think Goal Zero now is using a lithium battery. I haven't checked their voltage output uh, on that. Maybe something to look into. 
But a power station with a pure sine wave inverter will also be able to allow you to charge your laptop if we're using a wall wart. Homebrew antennas with number 26 silky wire and 3D parts. I showed you a picture of that. I use that. Uh, and it fits into a small little pouch. You can almost put it in your pocket or even in a suit jacket pocket uh, will fit nicely. So that's pretty lightweight and will work well. No tuners required. If you do need a tuner, I've been using the Elecraft T1, the ICOM tuner, as well as uh, various LDG tuners, depending on the radio I have. So they're all items that work very, very well. But the complexity of bringing these extra boxes and extra patch cord, you know, powering it and all that sometimes becomes a little bit more problematic. So uh, you may want to just consider using something that you can facilitate to be resonant. Now, resonant antennas, they don't need any tuners, right? Simplify your loadouts. I think I just explained that. Magnetic loops, they're pretty good for 20 meters and up, but due to their low efficiency of 40 meters, I really kind of don't recommend them at all. Um, I've been using uh, a couple of different, uh, different loops. The chameleon loops works very, very well. I uh, haven't had the greatest success with the precise RF loop. And I have an MFJ loop as well, too, that seems to work uh, pretty good. But however, as you go lower in frequency, the antenna is kind of too small to be very, very efficient. So you'll find that you may be putting in, you know, 50 watts of power into the magnetic loop on 40 meters and only getting a couple of watts out. For logging, uh, I get asked this a lot. I used HAM, Ham RS. Pretty good stable application. You can download it for Windows, even Linux, for those that are using Raspberry Pis. Uh, there's also a smartphone application for it as well, too. That one you have to pay for. The laptop one uh, is a free download, and they work very, very well. Coax connectors, fuses, coax backups in your vehicle. Um, yeah, I've gone to parks and showed up and... I forgot my coax or so I think once I forgot my radio, uh, but I was using my mobile radio and that's how we ended up doing a two meter FM simplex uh, activation. Um, uh, I could see into the city from the high spot I was. So that worked out very well. Uh, that was at the David Dunlop observatory, but you will find you may always forget some things. So if you have all this already in a bag under the seat of the car or in the trunk, then even if you forget something, you might be okay. It's the, BNC to SO239 connectors that I uh, seem to be always misplacing. Uh, probably a first aid kit would be a good idea to have, even, even especially if you're going to hike up or not. And also consider water and food. So if you're out, out and about for several hours and you're not having anything to eat, or more importantly, water, you may find yourself getting dehydrated. So multi-tools are going to be important. Have one of those with you. A um, couple of paracords here. I like this one from Gear Aid. Uh, comes with a bonus carabiner, but it also is reflective, so also serves its purpose uh, when things get dark, uh, so people don't uh, walk into your antenna. And obviously, we have the first aid kit. Now, in the bottom right-hand corner, I think this is a must. I have uh, I have four of these. I bought uh, another one when I was at uh, at Dayton in May. This is known as a Jaws clamp. Um, Amazon. Uh, Chameleon have them. Some CB shops have them. I saw one in a truck stop uh, in Florida that I picked up. Uh, I picked up one of those. These are ideal because it uh, allows you to connect the antenna to poles, uh, a guardrail uh, at the side of the road, <laughs> and uh, you do have the ability to put a stud mount on it. Uh, so you can plug in your MPAS antenna, ham stick, or anything like that, and then connect a ground radial to it, depending on what you're uh, connecting that to. So I think this is almost a standard requirement to bring with you. And yes, I bring it with me on the plane. No problem with TSA. Uh, they've never asked me what it was. So tip, it's all about having fun, right? Let's not get stressed out over all the, uh, the minute details. Let's go out and have some fun. It's about having new experiences, right? Activating a, a park on a, on a beach, activating a park from uh, a fire tower, activating a park that you chose to hike up for uh, for an hour to get to a high spot and get a wonderful view and make some contacts from there. And it's really about creating new pileups, right? You'll find that once you get spotted, uh, the hunters and chasers are sitting in front of their computers looking at the spotting screen and they say, oh, there's VE3 IPS. 
he's going to be op he's operating on this frequency. Let's go up to this frequency, see if we could work them. So there'll be times that you will spot yourself and then you got a couple of minutes in between. And by the time you start calling CQ, there'll be a bunch of stations want to call you. So here's an opportunity for a little pistol to be at the, the end of, of a pileup, if you will. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. I hope you found some value. I hope uh, a seasoned operator learned a couple of tips and tricks from me. Hopefully the beginners have a good idea from, from A to Z, what is required to operate. And again, I, th I think everyone should take the same approach that I did is the crawl, walk, run a port. Let's do what it is that we have with what we have today. Go out, make some contacts, get a feel for it. If you're enjoying the uh, this part of our hobby, then you can start now looking at doing portable operations where maybe you're not going to be car accessible or truck accessible to get to that location. And then if you're traveling, there's nothing like traveling to a new destination and adding a little bit of a ham radio into, um, into what it is that you're doing. And you may find that there's a, quite a few parks that have not been activated yet. So that just means the hunters and chasers have more parks to hunt and chase for and add to their list. And you're going to be helping them doing that. So with that, I'll uh, put aside any questions and answer, answers. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Well, John, a great uh, presentation, and I, I've certainly picked up uh, a few tips for my own uh, POTA activities. And we have a number of questions that have uh, come up here in the chat. So let's start with uh, KM6MTL. Okay, yeah, thanks, uh, Vince, for helping me out here. Uh, without your technical skills and AV club experience from, from high school, I think uh, we probably wouldn't have been able to pull it How off, did you know I was anyways, in the AV club? Uh, we all were. I was in the AV club too, right? We had There we to, go. Right? So, okay, so if you're not a POTA hunter or chaser uh, and not registered, when you make that contact with uh, one of those stations that is uh, active in, in Parks on the Air, they will upload the log and your contact will, will go in. So they don't, they don't get points. They, you need 10 points to activate a park, very important. Um, so they don't get any points for you know, having 1,000 contacts at a park. I don't think there's an award for it, but they will get... Um, they will get the point going towards their activation. So if they, you can assume they need 10 points for that. Um, there are special awards too. I know there's a six by six award, uh, pretty popular here. Uh, we've got a couple of six meter nets. I don't have that award because I'm the guy at the park activating on six meters. So the guys can get the six by six and then they go, John, hey, I got this six by six award. I go, well, yeah, thank you very much. Can you go to a park so I could activate, so I could, <laughs> um, so I can operate from you. So even though you participate in it and you don't keep a log, don't worry about it. Um, they'll put the log up and uh, uh, get the uh, recognition for it. Well, that's great. So uh, Bill is wondering what brand of fiberglass masts you recommend. Okay, um, I realized afterward I probably should have included something on that, but I didn't want to get into the complexity around the mass for uh, parks on the air. Uh, I know a couple of guys that will show up with, uh, you know, the typical 32, 33-foot mast, uh, guy riders and stuff like that. I, I, I walk over with my 817, throw a wire in the tree, and I'm making contacts, and they're still fiddling around with uh, with their mass. But uh, I have the MFJ brand. Um all these brands are all the same. The top elements are very, very thin, so they're not really going to hold up much of an antenna uh, and yep. may break off. So there have been some complaints from uh, fiberglass mask guys. The top piece breaks off. Well, yeah, no kidding. The thing's like, uh, I don't know, 16th of an inch. You can't put weight on it. It's really intended almost like a fishing pole. So MFJ, I've got Jackite. Uh, Jackite makes... Um, that one I think is probably the the nicest one I got, and one I got that from from Spider Beam. That actually comes from I think it's actually made in Germany. Uh, the quality of those are very good. The Jackite you can get them at a I got mine at a nature store, and people typically put like a I don't know a crow kite or some kind of an owl or something like that. It looks like it's flying in the air, and it keeps uh, other birds away. Um, so those are pretty rugged. Uh, the other one that I, I use a lot, um, very hard to find now in Canada, because the local uh, supplier for that uh, went out of business a few years ago. It's made by Shakespeare. 
Um, Sunny makes one as well, too. Apparently, Walmart's in the U.S. Uh, it's also known as a crappie pole, and um, it's about they're 20 feet long, and they're like 20 bucks. So something like that would be cheap and cheap uh, to pick up. Uh, perfect for 20 meters or even just holding up uh, the inverted V dipole. So this Pac-10 link dipole that I use a lot is just a 40, 20 meter. And I have that up about 18, uh, 20 feet as an inverted V. And uh, for the longest time, I use the uh, uh, the Shakespeare uh, antenna, uh, Shakespeare uh, fishing pole for that. So check your local uh, fishing pole supplier for that. Um Never put the wire inside the um, in the mast as well too. Just always have the mast outside because it does affect uh, um, it does affect the, the radiation capability. Real good. So Margaret is asking, uh, what do you use for a portable ground rod? That's an, that's yeah, so, always an interesting question for portable ops, right? Yeah, yeah. I uh, I kind of don't really use much of a ground if I'm using the impasse antenna. I do have a ground spike, Margaret, and that's made by Chameleon. Uh, it is a little bit pricey. It's done very well. I think it's like $50 US. Last time I was in uh, HRO in the US. Uh, right. But it's um, it's about 18 inches long. So what I did is I just went to, uh, I think it was a Home Depot. Uh, Ace Hardware may be a better choice, but in the US, uh, those stock short, short lengths of uh, aluminum tubing. So you could probably get a 12 inch length or a 24 inch length and cut it down. I'm probably going to make one that's 12 inches. I think the 18 inch can be, doesn't fit in my buddy pole bag. And then what I do is I just drill a hole through it and just put a bolt on it and put a banana jack on it or, or some kind of a, a plug. So I've been, I've been using that as a ground rod, but kind of, I kind of don't really need to use a ground typically unless it's part of the, the antenna design. But if you are concerned about it, you pr probably could put the ground rod to ground the radio to it. Um, I kind of don't really do that. So, um, but I do have it in my kit for, uh, uh, the other thing too is uh, make one with the uh, line driveway marker, those orange markers, grab one at Dollarana, Dollarama for three bucks, cut it down carefully to uh, uh, 18 inches. And then you can use that to keep the radial. You want to use all these vertical antennas uh, always have the radial not lying on the ground. Have it above the ground uh, um, a foot or two uh, to maximize the signal radiation. If it's lying on the ground, you're actually putting kind of signal in the ground and have something called ground losses that takes place. Now, here's my favorite question in the list. Do you have a checklist? Well, of course the answer is yes. <laughs> but how many of us uh, actually do this? Yeah, that, that seems like I'd be too organized in order to have a checklist before going out. So normally what I do is I have, uh, I have, uh, I use those, uh, uh, boxes from uh, craftsmen for their tool toolkits, uh, for their rolling tool case. And it's just a, a box with a handle on it, like a crate. Uh, so normally I have all my bits and pieces thrown into that. So I could just grab that in a radio. Um, usually what I'll do is I'll just sketch out as a more visual person. I'll just sketch out, you know, antenna, coax, radio, but that, but then you got to include the connectors. But I always say to myself, John, <laughs> when you're bored on a Zoom meeting at work, why don't you make a checklist and put it on a, um, a piece of cardboard or something like that, or laminate it and use that as a, as a, as a rollout. Now, when I travel, yeah, I do. I did put a list together of things that I wanted to bring, uh, but I forgot my rubber duck for my, uh, my, uh, my dual band handheld. So if I had a list, I would I had rubber duck antenna for handheld? Maybe, maybe not. So you may want to do that. All right. Uh, so let's take a look. Uh, is it possible to add new parks to the list and are county parks eligible? That's a two-parter. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, adding new parks to list, there is an administration function in the club, uh, in the group. Um we have a guy in Canada that does all the Canadian parks. So he's basically looking for latitude, longitude website, and probably some information on the park. If you got a couple of photos, you can shoot off to him. So he will uh, put in some parks. Um, now, um, in Canada, we have some parks that are almost considered to be city or county parks that were accepted uh, under the Canadian rules. I think we have different rules than the U.S., I was told in the U.S. it's only U.S. and state parks, but I don't see any reason why there wouldn't be local conservation area or larger parks that would be in your county. 
So what I would do is just, hey, you know, send an email out to the uh, park coordinator. It's usually done by call sign. So if you're in W5, yeah. there's probably a, a guy doing it for Texas. And just say, hey, here's the parks and give them a list of four or five parks you want thrown up and, and see what happens. That would be my recommendation. Yeah, real good. And that's a pretty quick process. I had one added recently in VE6 and it uh, and it, it wasn't uh, very painful. I had to answer some questions to fill in the form for uh, the VE2 who handles our stuff. Uh, so Ken wants to know if you have any recs for fold-up panels. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so uh, Ken, I, I, I've got a bunch of solar panels. Uh, there's a bunch on Amazon lately that um, – you just got to be careful which ones you order, but some are just very much like a five volt USB on it, but you want something that might have a jack or to be able to get to uh, the raw 12 volts. Uh, some of the gold zero stuff has that. Um, but I've seen a bunch of 60 watt panels for pretty reasonable money, like 60, 70, 80 bucks uh, that would be applicable. The other brand that probably is very well known for pan uh, for power is um power film so they make uh i have one that you can roll up and they have one that's really nice in a camel pattern that uh i think it's a 100 watt panel that folds up that one's uh they're kind of expensive they're four or five hundred dollars us but i've i've seen the uh, i've seen them at dayton and they're they're very very rugged and obviously a 100 watt panel you're going to get more juice but you know my park activations are typically uh they can be 20 minutes or they can be uh an hour to an hour um and um, so in that case, I don't I don't really think I need to top up my panel or my battery using solar because um, I know that the battery I'm bringing out is going to hold the charge and, and keep me operating for that time duration. So I don't really worry about it. Right. And it's just another thing you got to set up and then you need a charge controller. But if you're going to be out, you know, for a weekend or you're camping and doing different park activities and stuff like that, then, yeah, it probably makes sense. Because that was the question. How do you charge your batteries? Right. Maybe something you want to uh, give that in consideration. So well, I, I'd look up power film. And uh, and power film, as I understand it, down in Dayton, they'll sometimes sell off their cosmetic sec and they sell it as a seconds at a considerable discount to their normal list price. Yeah, so. I didn't see it this year. So. Um, yeah, yeah, they're not they're not there all the time. So uh, William can't find that Jaws clamp on Amazon. So we have to enable some purchasing during this presentation, or else it wouldn't be <laughs> truly moderated by Ham Radio Workbench. Um, yeah, what's yeah. the brand name on that? I'll see if I can. I, find I don't know. Link. I don't know. It's I I bought three different three different versions. So one I bought originally uh, came directly from Chameleon. Um, I believe it's uh, last time I checked was forty dollars US pre COVID pricing. Yep. I don't know what it would be now. I bought one at a same. truck stop. Um, I don't know what brand it was. It was just, I don't know, like GT brand. They just repackaged it or something like that. Um, and then um, the other one would be, uh, I don't know, is, is do they have it as Workman in Canada, Vince? Yep. Yeah, it's so Workman work, in Canada. Workman that's has right. one that's a Workman brand, so you can probably check on Workman brand as well too. Yeah, I'm gonna po I'm gonna post a link here uh, to the Chameleon one um, in uh, a moment. We'll uh, we'll move on to another question here. Oh, I want to know this answer to um, Elizabeth. How many radios does John own? Because I'm getting the impression that there's quite a collection in his basement. Oh, Elizabeth is very good friends with my wife, and my wife is listening, so I think she probably texted you, Elizabeth, to find out what the real... Ah, uh, is that what's going on? All those radios are under $100, so... <laughs> um, I have probably uh, too many radios, so... Uh, the one I used to use a lot was the FT891. I also used that as a, a little bit of a travel radio. I replaced that with an FT100D because it has UHF, VHF, and kind of replace the 857D I had with the, the snake pattern on the, the display. Um, the one that I probably, um, I've replaced that radio now with an ICOM 7400, which is a 20 pound radio. And then I didn't think it out because it, it draws uh, two amps, which is not the greatest, but I bring a 30 amp hour battery. So that's fine for a couple hours, but it has a built-in tuner, a B switch, big knobs on it and dials. I know a lot of guys are bringing 7300s out. Uh, but the, the my really go-to setup is the buddy pole antenna, the impasse antenna, and um, the Pac-10 link dipole. Um, I'll choose different ones. And fat antennas are fine. There's a lot of guys are using that. Um, 
I just haven't been using it. I just find the inverted V dipole seems to work better for me and I don't need a tuner for it. So that was kind of the, the whole reason behind it. But the 891 does not have a tuner. 817 doesn't have a tuner. 705 don't have a tuner. Their QRP radios are okay for travel, but if you're driving up to a park, you know, you probably want to run, you know, 20 watts or 50 watts. So you'll probably have a proper HF radio. So um, uh, can't answer the question, but if you look at my website, you'll probably figure it out. Well, real good. I mean, as it goes, John, I'll take one for the team. And if you ever need me to, I'll be happy to buy your gear for whatever you told your wife you paid for it. Um, so here's a link to one of the JAWS clamps uh, to answer William's question. That's the one from Chameleon uh, that I know some of the candy stores up here in Canada stock. So that's... Maybe uh, to buy it in Canada and ship it down to... Uh, yeah, you can find these at uh, fine retailers in uh, the United States as well, right? Whatever so. you do, whatever you do, guys, buy like a couple of them. So um, there is a, a Anthony, I can't remember his call sign. He's in Ohio. I know he's part of this um, Cuso party. He's got a, I think he's doing a couple of presentations. I actually bought, uh, we bought a couple off him at Dayton. And then I come home and it's like, oh, my buddy goes, hey, did what did you buy a date? And I said, Oh, I bought a couple of jaw clamps. He goes, thanks for getting me one. So <laughs> I have well, four now instead of five. Yeah. And now somebody has just posted in uh, what it's called on Amazon. Uh, so I am just going to try and get that, uh, that product link up here. If it wants to play with me, that is, uh, it's called a quick release. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, that's Work, a work, workman work, work, antenna work, work, release mirror. mirror. Yeah, that's a that's a mouthful for you. I'll have the link up in just a moment here. Um, let me see what else we've got. Yeah, Anthony uh, KHZT. He's he's monitoring there. I guess he probably jumped on as soon as I mentioned. Uh, yeah. So we got a nice uh, table. We bought a bunch of things off him. Yeah. Uh, there we go. So I've got the the link almost ready to go here. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, for any last-minute questions that uh, people might have. Here we go. This is the link to the uh, Amazon product. And uh, thank you so much to uh, Roger, who pointed out the uh, proper name of it for me. And that's the Canadian link, but you'll find it in the States too, right? Well, I picked up a, a bunch of great tips today, uh, uh, John. So uh, pleasure working with you. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping to have real good luck with uh, my next activation uh, whenever I get off my duff and uh, go and do it. So uh, thanks very much for uh, being here today at QSO Today and uh, giving such an excellent presentation. Oh, one thing I should have mentioned is park to park. So you'll be operating sometimes at a park. Other guys will be operating at a park. So guys will jump in and go park to park and then you'll work guys from their park to your park, I think you get an extra point or credit for it or something like that. It's always kind of interesting uh, to kind of do some park to park stuff. So one day we will try to work Vince from park to park on probably 20 meters. I don't think we got propagation yep. out to that. We'll, we'll get West 20 Coast meters. Day, yeah. Yeah. And, and, we'll get... and other guys on here too. We'll probably have a chance to, to work everybody. Just say, Hey John, I saw you on the, for sure. On the QSO today. We have, uh, and you can one... always email me if you guys need any other stuff. We have one more quick question here just before we close out. From Josh. Oh yeah, Josh, go to the, 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 there is a thing on the POTA website that will say about you parks. Uh, it's kind of done by call sign. So there'll be a volunteer uh, in uh, in the six land there that will uh, handle your, your park registration and stuff like that. So you can reach out with an email and send them coordinates and pictures and, you know, screenshot of Google Maps or something like that. Let the guy know what the park's like and yeah. they'll, they'll get it set up. And the POTA website uh, URL, John? Um, I think it's poda.org, right? Or poda.app.app poda .app is oh, their okay. new, is their new website. So that's great. Well, John, Hey, thanks very much. We've got a, a few people with great, uh, thank you comments. Here's just one of them. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Great to work with you. Thanks for coming out today. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Take care guys. Have a great right. day and enjoy the parks. 73.